You know, this is Facebook in 2002. It's probably Mark Zuckerberg probably watched this film mm. and didn't think it was a mm. dystopia, right? Mm. He's probably mm. like, that's a pretty good idea. Mm. Hi, I'm Chaz Fisher. And I'm Stu Willis. And welcome to Draft Zero, a podcast where two Aussie filmmakers try to work out what makes great screenplays work. And on today's episode... Today's part... Part? Part episode? Episode part? (sighs) Whatever it is. Part four of our epic series on antagonists, we're going to be talking about versus world or versus system, which is something we in ourselves have been debating what to call it. So, it'll be interesting to see who ultimately wins when this is released. Mm-hmm. We, wanting, we are looking- I'll give the films first, which is we are looking at Minority Report, Mudbound, The Lobster. And I'm, I really do want to talk about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Hopefully, we've got time to do four. And I think we, we picked this topic because- and we left it for last because these kinds of versus systems versus world versus society stories- tend to kind of have the antagonistic force to manifest it in multiple ways. Our theory before we started recording was that the versus humans versus self and versus kind of nature elements of the previous topics would come to bear in this epi- in, in these films. Mm. But I think, I think we probably in doing it have found that there's other ways that the antagonistic forces or, yes, the antagonistic forces, the pressures, the obstacles, the pushes, mm-hmm. the pullers, the enablers, the challenges- mm. Um, the mentors manifest in these stories. I think I think these stories, the reason why right at the very beginning, before we even chose the homework or really figured out what we meant by versus system or versus world, the reason why I wanted to do it is that there are clearly films out there where you can say that the antagonist is, in the case of Mudbound, racism. Now, racism in that film is dramatised through various different antagonistic forces and that's why we've left it till last and i think the reason why we're going to start with minority report is it's a real trope of science fiction as a genre which pits the protagonist against the system that is currently the dominant system of the world in which the protagonist is living and it and it's that character's mission to overthrow the the world the rules the system i don't think it's always them to overrule it but often i i would say there's broadly speaking of which minority port report is an example of the film there is a character who is part of the system learns the truth about the system and then either and then is faced with a choice the pressures of that they are either they either succumb to the system mm. Or they escape the system or they overthrow it. I mean, I think 1984 is an example of someone who ultimately succumbs to the system of Big Brother, you know, and, and yeah. Brave New World. And it's it's no mistake that we're mentioning dystopias. And in a way, mm. Minority Report and The Lobster, and I don't even say Mudbound, a dystopia. And yes, Mudbound is an historical drama, but I think this is an interesting, and this is somewhat by the by, but, you know, there's that idea that science, that the genres have a setting and then they have kind of narrative tropes and there's setting tropes. And I think there is an element of versus system or versus society stories that is attached to science fiction, but is also true of period films, you know? Yeah. You've often pointed out to me that Ridley Scott is suited to doing both science fiction and period dramas like Gladiator and Kingdom of Heaven because- He just makes science fiction that is as period. Yeah. (laughs) And the point of setting a film in a period is because, to me, whether it's a future setting or a, a, a period setting, is it gives the audience a measure of distance to actually look at something- in a new light, like by by seeing a film as powerful as Mudbound, it allows us to reassess racism within our own contemporary life. Yeah, it gives the to use the term aesthetic distance, which is particularly appropriate given that we're doing the lobster and the whole thing is very Brechtian, <laughs> incredibly Brechtian um, with its distancing tactics. Yeah, I don't know if I have much to say in terms of lead up to this because that's kind of my thesis that ultimately in all these stories that we are looking at the pressures the the sequence of antagonistic forces are orchestrated in such a way to 
push the character the, 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 it, on an individual level, but the, the main character that we're following, whether it's the pr- protagonist or just a point of view character or whatever, doesn't matter, to they reach a, a, ultimately facing a choice about the system itself. I don't think in any of these films, like, it, it's not that it's specifically like, I'm going to burn, I'm going to blow up the Death Star, kind of, I'm going to tear down the system, but it's more, do they succumb to the system? Do they find a way to escape it or do they attempt to overthrow it? Hmm. I, I think you articulated it well with those three questions. I, I was just going to say, I think there's a we're going to find a big difference in the films like Minority Report where the protagonist is aware that the world is the antagonist. And in movies like Mudbound, the characters are aware that racism is an antagonistic force, but they're not trying to- None of the characters have the objective of ending racism. No. And so, that leads to a different kind of movie as a result of whether the- the And this goes back to what we were talking about in part three versus nature, how defeatable- is the system the antagonistic force? Can you overcome? Can you actually negotiate with the system? Can you change the system? I mean, I think with the lobster, I'm going to say that I don't think the character question is will he uh, can he overthrow the system? No, but I think it's whether he'll submit to it or escape to it or find a way to make it work for him. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and which is why I want to do it because I've got a very particular read of the Dawn of the Planet Apes in the context of this that I think is ultimately the kind of the pessimistic version of this. And I think there is no better way to start than Minority Report because it's so beautiful in that way. The future can be seen. All we have to run on are the images that they produce. We see what they see. There hasn't been a murder in six years. There's nothing wrong with the system. It is perfect. I agree. Murder can be stopped. Tell me exactly what it is you're looking for. Flaws. Did we get any false positives? We are arresting individuals who have broken no law. But they will. The fact that you prevent it from happening doesn't change the fact that it was going to happen. The system can't be wrong. Run! Wait! You say something to you? No. You're in a lot of trouble, John. I have a warrant in my pocket that says murder. Don't run. You don't have to chase me. So, Minority Report follows uh, John Anderton, played by Tom Cruise, and it's set- the, the premise of the film is that it's set in a particular city where they have- div- Washington, isn't it? I, I think you may be right. I had forgotten which particular city, but that feels right. It's set in a particular city where they've developed a technology to be able to predict murders before they happen. And so, it's called pre-crime- So, they arrest people before they've even committed the crime. And the premise is that uh, John Anderton- Who is the uh, chief of pre-crime, which is important. Yeah. He's the chief. Gets a- sees uh, the system, shows him murdering someone. He goes on the run and it's the the remainder of pre-crime are hunting after him. So, this is- it's so- the setup is so beautiful. So, the believer, the complete believer in the system- The enforcer. Yeah. He's an enforcer who is a absolute convert- convert to the system, chief of pre-crime, has- has the balls, these wooden balls come out from the pre-gods, which show that he is about to commit a murder. So, he's a very fundamental worldview, and this is something I'm actually going to be talking about in all four episodes, and probably should have mentioned in the beginning introduction. His worldview is challenged, because either he is a murderer, and pre-crime works, or he is not a murderer, and pre-crime is wrong. Yeah. That is this- that is kind of the question. And the film Mm -hmm. frames its thematic question about free will in this great speech. Let's not kid ourselves. We are arresting individuals who have broken no law. But they will. The commission of the crime itself is absolute metaphysics. The pre see the future, and they're never wrong. But it's not the future if you stop. Isn't that a fundamental paradox? Yes, it is. You're talking about predetermination, which happens all the time. Why'd you catch that? Because it was going to fall. You're certain? Yeah. But it didn't fall. You caught it. The fact that you prevent it from happening doesn't change the fact that it was going to happen. And that's kind of the, the framing device. 
But there's a couple of things that I think in terms of antagonistic forces that you can take away from this. Because I don't I don't want to necessarily burrow in any particular scenes, though I think the film itself is, is beautifully executed. It's actually one mm. of my favourite Spielbergs, which is that there's a few aspects to it, which is there is the- John Anderson is the believer whose belief in the system is challenged, but there are the enforcers of the system. They're out to get him, but in in all these four films, you will see that there are characters who are still part of the system. That is why it's a system, right? That they are believers, that they haven't they haven't seen the truth of the system's flaws, right? Or are beneficiaries of it. Or beneficiaries. There is the character, the Burgess, the superior, who is kind of like, I guess, the Wizard of Oz, the, the puppet master, mm. the patriarch, which is relevant to Mudbound, you know, mm. and- There's also- the technology of the so, world. So, one of the major set pieces is a self-driving car chase scene. So, in a film which is about thematically free about free will, there he has to have a an incredibly uh, action-packed chase in cars that have no free will. Yeah. Oh, and so there's a couple of other sources of pressure, which are really great. So there's one more immediately in John, which is there is a timeline for when he's meant to be killing this man, which, as his investigation will reveal, is the man that may have been responsible for the death of John's child. So there's kind of like the personal um, antagonistic force of the death of this kid, the character wound, which we introduced yes. early on. So the wound is actually a source of pressure on the character. And coming back to our Marvel first X episode, that's an interesting way to think about the character wound is it's a source of pressure, which is different from a flaw. The wound is a wound is a pressure. So he's got that wound, believes, and then it comes up will and it creates the question of will he or won't he. But then there's the so there's the ticking clock, the character wound, and then there is this basically this vote that is gonna go to take pre crime yeah. national. And there's one of those great almost hmm. um Verhoeven-esque video introductions talking about the technology of pre crime and how they're going to vote on it going yes. And that's important because the conspiracy, because this has got elements of a conspiracy thriller, like it's so good, it's all super laid, is about they're going to take it national. And the, the, and they refer to it as the system. They talk about pre crime and the infall- infallibility infallibility, mm. the infallibility of the system is something that actually mm. in there. There is the film itself is very much aware that pre crime is a system. On its measure it is infallible. They haven't since pre crime has been implemented, there hasn't been a murder in that area. It's just whether they have been imprisoning innocent people or not is the key question to be resolved. But I wanna just burrow down into what you're talking about in terms of the the political uh antagonistic force and the conspiracy because i think they've they've made some genius craft decisions and what prompted this is today i was randomly listening to a bbc inquiry podcast about the dictator's survival guide like what do dictators have to do you know i was looking at dictators all over the world but mugabe was in power for 40 years so it's like what do dictators have to do to survive and One of it was implement the control apparatus. Uh, Yeah. And one of the things that this film does so well is it says, well, here's pre-crime, but it is limited pre-crime to just one city and that there is the goal to implement the system nationwide. So, the fact that it's only in one city and it is yet to go nationwide is crucial to the idea that the system can be overthrown. Ah, yeah. Could be thwarted. Within a year, pre-crime effectively stopped murder in our nation's capital. In the six years we've been conducting our little experiment, there hasn't been a single murder. And now pre-crime can work for you. We want to make absolutely certain that every American can bank on the utter infallibility of this system. And to ensure that what keeps us safe will also keep us free. Pre-crime? It works. 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 On Tuesday, April 22nd, vote yes on the National Pre Crime Initiative. If pre crime was all over the world and had been implemented for 50 years, as opposed to being. It's only been around for, I can't remember how long it was, but a, a relatively recent thing. Yeah, like six, five six, years. Mm. 
It's only been around relatively recently. It's being proposed and it's being audited. The Colin Farrell character is the person who's designed to test pre-crime to see if it works or not. Yeah, he represents the Department of Justice. So, I think that's really important. Tom- Colin Farrell's character, Atwer, is a antagonistic force on the system itself. In fact, he is a more of a threat to Burgess, uh, mm. who is the patriarch of the system, than he mm. is to Adderton. Because he's not investigating Adderton, right? He's investigating Burgess and pre-crime, which actually reminds me a little bit of Gattaca. Anyway, um and I'm pretty sure- So, what, what is interesting coming back to what we're talking about, goals and obstacles, because this is something we haven't talked about much on this podcast, like in Draft Zero as a whole, but antagonism is so related to goals and obstacles, because the antagonist, or at least obstacles specifically, stop, are about stopping the character getting their goal. If they have no goal, how do you antagonize them, right? Mm, yeah. Like- you can't. It's it seems so obvious. And often the anta- sources of antagonism create the goal. Yeah. Like how do I they create the boss question, how do I overcome that? And then it becomes the sequence of therefore but, therefore but. So in this case, he Adderton learns that he is going to murder um whatever the 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 he's got to piece that together, Crow. Right. So part of the whole thrill, particularly in the opening of Minority Report, is they still have to piece together the crime from imagery. Mm. So it's not like they've just been given like a booklet of what's going to happen. There is still just the kind of little plot obstacles of will they pull the pieces together? And mm. then he works out who that um what's going to go well, on. Well it gives He's- him it gives him the the detective engine of the film is he has to find because he doesn't know the person who he's uh, who Who he's been told he's going to kill who am i going to kill and why and in doing that investigation he ends up with the decision that he is going to kill that person by discovering who he is now now one of the things that we've really glossed over in terms of antagonism is the how the technology works itself oh there's heaps of yeah go on I think that's specifically important, yeah. So, pre-crime, the way that they are able to create these imagistic predictions of future murders is through uh, the children of uh, drug addicts, people who are pregnant, were users of a new hallucinogenic drug while pregnant, children Hmm. born from that addiction. sounds like the plot of Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Children born of drug addicts, LSD experiments run by the CIA mm-hmm. in the 60s, perhaps. In Washington, D.C., the way the pre-crime predictions work is there's three, they call them pre-cogs. And it's something that I've only really come to terms with in looking at the film through this lens, because it's not very dealt with in the film, but the pre-cogs journey is also an expression of free will versus determined. Determination. Because they're slaves. They have no free will. Tell me how all this works. The photon milk acts as both a nutrient supply and a liquid conductor. It enhances the images that each of them receive. We call the female Agatha. The twins are Arthur and Dash. We scan by way of optical tomography. White light pinpoints pulse along the entire length of the headgear and are reread after absorption through their brain tissue. In other words, we see what they see. They don't feel any pain. We keep their heads pretty well stocked with dopamine and endorphins. Plus, we maintain careful control over their serotonin levels. Don't want them to drift off into too deep a sleep. They can't be kept too awake either. It's better if you don't think of them as human. No, they're much more than that. They're they're trapped into this system because they're serving to the greater good, right? And ultimately, it's so important that the film ends that once the system is brought down, there's a shot of the three of the precogs just free in a house mm. in the countryside, living by themselves. They win agency and determination from slavery by bringing down a system that was based on the idea of predetermination. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that in there. But no, and it's, that is actually great. It, it remind is it maybe a Neil Gaiman or Terry Pratchett? folk story about the kid that is sacrificed to the cave and basically- uh, yeah. It's in um, American Gods. It's one of the- um, not, not to give it 
you know, spoil a book as well as, <laughs> and potentially a TV series, but he's the god that li- ends up living in the snow town that ends up putting mm. kids in the boots of cars and sinking them. Oh, there you go. Um, but that's the idea of if if you could protect the world by by sacrificing three children, is that something you're prepared to do? And it, you know, this is what's pretty interesting about this film is it came out in 2010. They were shooting it during September 11, and the whole during that period, they were shooting it, you know, um, just before or just after September 11, and the kind of anxiety about the surveillance state. I mean, it's so relevant. You know, what mm. price security? What, how much are you willing to give up? You know, that's one of the defining things. But what's interesting about the precogs is they are both, a, as you say, they've got their own journey, but they are kind of not necessarily an antagonistic force, but they're a goal. Because what happens is Adderton is on the run and he's got this question of what do I do about Crow, which kind of defines, like, I guess the question from the first act to the end of the third act. And then in the middle, he meets the inventor of- Pre-crime, who is- One of the co-inventors. Co-inventors, Dr. Iris Heinemann. Mm -hmm. And she reveals that there is this thing called the Minority Report, (laughs) which is Agatha, played by Samantha Morton, where she can have a different vision of an alternate future. The pre-cogs are never wrong. But occasionally, they do disagree. What? Most of the time, all three precognitives will see an event in the same way, but once in a while, one of them will see things differently than the other two. Jesus Christ. Why didn't I know about this? Because these minority reports are destroyed the instant they occur. Why? Obviously, for pre-crime to function, there can't be any suggestion of fallibility. After all, who wants a justice system that instills doubt? It may be reasonable, but it's still doubt. And that this has been kept a secret by Mr. Patriarch, I'm pretty sure. If she doesn't say that it's him. Should we just call him Max von Sydow? (laughs) Uh, Burgess. I'm just going to say it's Burgess. I found out what it is. And that if- And basically, Adderton now has a new goal, which is get to- Steal Agatha. Yeah. Steal Agatha and prove his innocence. And then Agatha comes along and then she becomes- Like, she's physically doesn't walk. So, she's a, a physical obstacle to him. You know, and there's the whole sequence of him having to break in. And part of him having to break in is that he has to get an eye transplant because there's optical mm. recognition everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, targeted- Basically, like, targeted web banners. You know, this yeah. is Facebook in 2002. It's probably- Mark Zuckerberg probably watched this film mm. and didn't think it was a mm. dystopia, right? Mm. He's probably mm. like- <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. Um, He did not take the moral lessons from the film. Um, And then, I mean, this reveals the conspiracy. And I don't think we need to to reveal it too much. But you can see how there's these, all these things. And it leads to, it pressurizes to Adderton to this, this, this decision. It's not the final decision, but it's a key decision for him. Which is once he's worked out the crow or believes that crow... Uh, is at this hotel room and it's just coming down in the 36 hours, right? So, time is against him, but it kind of makes him fulfill this. He believes that Crow is a serial child killer. This is Sean, my son. Every day for the last six years, I've thought about only two things. The first is what my son would look like if he were alive today. If I would recognize him if I saw him on the street. The second is what I would do to the man who took him. You're right. I'm not being set up. And he makes the choice to not kill him. Crow actually grabs the gun and kills himself. Yeah. But at that point, Adderton is confronted with the truth that the system that pre-crime doesn't work. Because until that point, mm. he still believes in pre-crime. The fact that yeah. there's this minority report doesn't say, say pre-crime doesn't work. It means that there is doubt, but it doesn't mean that the whole system, the system itself is broken. At yeah. this point, I, he's beginning gonna, to realize the system is broken. I'm going to go a step further 
I mean, mm. just to hop back to a, a point that you've made is that there's all these wonderful set pieces and sequences leading up to this. And I think in those set pieces and sequences, um, Anderton is not always the protagonist. I think the Colin Farrell character is occasionally the antagonist. Like in the sequence where Anderton is kidnapping Agatha, mm. I think Anderton is the antagonist and Colin Farrell is the protagonist. There's a scene where where Colin Farrell figures out, like figures out the conspiracy and Burgess shoots him. That's a scene just between Colin Farrell and Burgess. There's so that that's just me going back to reinforce your part one thesis that the scene and sequence protagonists and antagonists can change. But going back to that that choice that Anderton is presented with to kill whom he believes is the murderer of his son. Up until that point, there's a whole sequence where even though uh, Samantha Morton, Agatha, where Agatha presents a physical antagonistic force to her own extraction from pre-crime, she also uh, assists in her escape by using her abilities to predict the future. There's oh, a- left, right, stay here, five oh. seconds, whatever it is. So- Everything in the movie, up until the point of Anderton's decision to shoot Crow or not, shows that pre-crime works, that predestination is real, that we don't have choice Mm. until he makes the choice. So, that's what I think is even more interesting about the sources of antagonistic- the, the antagonistic forces in this film is that they actually show that the system is perfect. They're questioning the worldview. Well, they're kind of- there is a worldview of the system that the, the film is demonstrating, but ultimately it, it comes undone. I mean, his worldview, what I'm trying to, and I'm, I'm coming back to it because we've mentioned a bunch of times down, this scene, ultimately this dilemma here that he is confronted with Crow is about his worldview about pre-crime and all this evidence that Agatha, because she is, to- we are told that she is the best of the precogs, that she is the strongest. So he should give it to her, but he actually is liberated by her. If she told him you're going to have to shoot him, he probably would have actually done it. If she told him you don't actually shoot him, that's my minority report. He wouldn't have shot him. In fact, he was handing over his fate. She was giving him agency at this point of the film. And my one criticism of it when I saw it, right, and I know why they did it, but he, I, I didn't believe that Tom Cruise was going to kill this guy because it's Tom Cruise. If they mm-hmm. made Colin Farrell, if they cast Colin Farrell as Don Adderton and then made Tom Cruise the cop mm-hmm. investigating pre-crime, that would have been an interesting film to me in terms of what you bring to it. Because of the system of Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And time and all this stuff orchestrates into this moment because he's got the gun on him and the watch is counting down. And you can go and go, am I going to do this thing? Am I doing it just because I'm being told to do it? Yeah. And then we get into the kind of like the fourth act of the film after the Colin Farrell character has been killed by Burgess, which works mm-hmm. so beautifully because Adderton, by stealing Agatha, means that pre-crime mm-hmm. is no longer working. Of course, it would have to be someone with access to the previsions in the first place. Someone fairly high up. Do you know what I hear? Nothing. No footsteps up the stairs. No hovercraft out the window. No clickety-click of little spiders. Do you know why I can't hear any of those things, Danny? Because right now, the precogs can't see a thing. So, Burgess can kill him, which reveals himself as the villain, right? Yeah. And there's some stuff about broken families in there, but ultimately, Adderton confronts, Mm. escapes, is let out of the prison where he sees all his dreams come true and he manages Mm -hmm. to be let out by his ex-wife who decides that she wants to reconcile with him. This is the Philip K. Dick stuff that I love. Mm. The film didn't Mm -hmm. lean into it. I don't think it's interested in this question of whether or not the ending of the film is a dream. 
other than mm. it being kind of like a ending, like a puzzle, but I don't think it really is. In, it's, it's like the ending of Inception. Yeah. Um, but basically, Lara lets him out, which is his ex-wife. A new report is generated at pre-crime and then Burgess would kill Anderton is kind of what it says. Burgess mm. confronts Anderton at the- do you know where it's basically, it's like, it's something to do with the election, the vote. Okay. It, yeah. It's thematically relevant. But basically, he, Anderton becomes the the antagonist for Burgess at this yeah. point. And he basically says to Burgess- In that last sequence, Burgess is definitely the the protagonist and Anderton is the antagonist. Yeah. He, he actually, he took, his action was killing the detective, Colin Farrell's um, character- whatever he's called, and Whitmer, killing Whitmer. And then, yeah, he's he's basically this final sequence is actually- I mean, we follow him for a bit with Burgess with Lara. Like, he becomes almost the POV character. And then Adderton comes in and basically says- You see the dilemma, don't you? If you don't kill me, precogs were wrong and pre-crime is over. If you do kill me, you go away. But it proves the system works. Precogs are right. And so you lose either either way. And that's meant to reveal the flaw of the system, I guess, which is that once people know what their future is, they can they can change it. Or aware yeah, that they which have a is, future. Which I I I while I get that it's only Anderton and Burgess. And I, and I agree with the, the conceptual idea of it. I also think that the film cleverly posits that there is still choice all the way along. They don't know. I think it- Because there's a minority report. Maybe he chose in that decision that, that because, all this because stuff- Because the that- precogs can see alternative futures. Yes. You're right. And in fact, our reading of the film changes, and then it makes us question it because maybe the guy, whenever he's in the very in the open, the cold open that shows the technology in action, hmm. maybe he doesn't really kill his wife. Yeah, you know, and and that's the danger of hmm. precognition. So it makes us because hmm. it does a good job of you going, oh wow, the system really works. Yeah, and then you see added to our hero, like on a meta level, you're like, oh, our lead character is now being framed for murder, but it's Tom Cruise. Hmm. This either means the system doesn't work or he's going to blah, blah, blah. Like it, it kind of leads. Yeah, us on it, a it definitely, it definitely leads us to believe that it isn't the system that's broken. He's being framed. And that's why he, that's his initial belief as well. I think he even says it when the, that pre-crime prediction comes in. And that his mission is to prove that he's being framed, not not, to- not that pre-crime doesn't work. And that is his huh, need to to um to come back to our discussion from the previous part. Like the character need is to that the writer wants to take him, which is he has to give up the system. That the believer in the system has to no longer believe it. But his wants very early on have nothing to do with that. Yeah, in fact, they're absolutely. about keeping the system intact. He is possibly willing to sacrifice himself for the system. Um, and I think just in coming back to kind of, like, we haven't really touched on rules in the world and stuff like that, but they are related. A lot of the technology we see that forms an antagonist in the film, like, it's related to surveillance and it's related to self-determination, automated machinery. Um, but all the stuff to do with his eyes and them scanning the eyes and him needing this operation and then the little spiders, they're to do with surveillance, of which pre-crime is surveillance. So, yeah. they found a way, the writers have found a way to make it feel cohesive because the antagonistic forces, whether they're obstacles or pressure or kind of enablers, like pushers or pullers or whatever, I don't know. Mm-hmm. They, they, my terms are inspecific for good reason, um, are- Related to the world, that the, the system itself, you know? Yeah. I think one of the things I'm probably going to get to at the end, but Minority Report is a real clear example of this, is I think you make the choice to have a world or a system antagonist where you've got a very strong thematic message to deliver. Whether the 
the plot and the genre will change depending on whether you want the protagonist to actively try to overthrow the system or not. But regardless of those conventions, you can choose a system or a world being the antagonist when you're trying to say something thematically. And it's just, it goes to the writing of the script and God, we should probably look up who wrote uh, Minority Report because it's an amazing screenplay in my estimation. It's a number of writers, but I think the main one was- um- Oh, Scott Frank. Oh, Scott Frank. Wow. There we go. Enough said. Uh, but we chose Minority Report because it's such a clear example, such a great example of the the use of the world being an antagonistic force. But it is also, as we've discussed, dramatized those through characters who are antagonistic forces. Uh, uh, I'll say nature in that they're unsentient. I mean, it's kind of the point of the film is- choice and sentience but through the the cars and then the whole idea the whole foundation of the technology they could have invented pre-crime through some kind of algorithm right but they didn't they had pre it's organic and it is the way that pre-crime works is by well i was going to say the when I, to me, I think a key thematic thing about how precogs, how pre-crime works as a premise is that it is through the enslavement and the removal of choice of people. Mm. Anyway. Yes. No, I think that's great. That's a really great summary of it. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to suggest that we move on to Dawn of the Planet the Apes now. And I don't think we'll necessarily do it as in depth even though I think it's a great film, but it's it's clearly- I mean, that whole trilogy has a very clear journey over the three now films. Is, is Dawn the first or the second one? Second. Okay. I always get confused because to I me, know. Rise. Rise should happen after the dawn. But it's Rise, Dawn, War. Got it. I know why you're scared. It was a virus created by scientists in a lab. You can't blame the apes. Who the hell else am I going to blame? We need to give them a chance. Welcome to animals. Please. I've seen things. I've seen the way they are. If they want what we want, to survive. Caesar, home. This is your home. Your home. Are you aware they are going to turn on you? They don't want a war. No, don't shoot! But in this particular one, the reason I wanted to choose this is it does a couple of things which also connect to Mudbound structurally. Because I'm going to say that the Dawn of the Planets, the Ape, the system in this film is violence and distrust. It's not a system like Minority Report, which is clearly like this thing architected. There's nothing architected in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So, it's a sequel to Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which for whatever reasons is the first one. And basically, there is this virus, the ALZ113 virus, otherwise known as the simian flu, has this double effect. It increases the intelligence of primates that aren't humans. So, chimpanzees- Mm. Apes, gorillas. While also having a high mortality rate on humans. So, it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, which, if you would watch Contagion, you'd realize is a pretty high mortality rate. Plus, the implication is during the opening of the film, like my already report, where they set the, up the world. I mean, this is not a versus systems film. This is a versus world film. Let me say that. It's not architected. It's about the world, but it's not about a system that has been designed. Well, I think I think that is the big difference between the first and the second film, because I think you could articulate both films as versus world, right? From Caesar's perspective, if you look at Caesar as the protagonist, and I don't think Caesar is the protagonist. He's one of the protagonists in the first film, but I think James Franco's character. Yes. But Caesar 
gains skills is educated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is educated, but also put under such antagonistic pressures like that he's put in that horrible Ugh. containment. Tortured and Yeah, where mm. he ends up seeing the human world as the enemy. Mm. And that he must escape it, mm. right? So he take the the culmination of that film is him taking it and escaping it. Yeah, that's right. They- now I would say the human, the human world in that film, while it's not consciously crafted, they certainly make conscious decisions about where animals sit in that hierarchy. We don't mean any harm. They're apes, man. You think they understand what you're saying? <laughs> Do they look like just apes to you? <laughs> Animals are animals and are less than humans and can be mistreated is a rule of the world that Caesar rebels against once he gains his intelligence. And even though they have intelligence, even though they have clear sentience, there is a division, there is a speciesism along human lines. That is a really great read. So, in the second film, the apes have escaped. They've basically set up their own ape world. Kind of like Disneyland for apes up in these mount uh, in these whatever forest it is near San Francisco, and unbeknownst to them, humans have moved back into San Francisco and also building their community. And unbeknownst to them, or we realise they have some idea, but not the extent of it, is this ALZ one one three virus, the virus that made the apes and primates smart, wiped out all humans, and also that pressure itself led humans to basically killing each other in the violence. Those who aren't killed by the virus will probably die in the fighting. So, maybe this is it. This is how it ends. Pretty soon, there won't be anyone left. And so, it's kind of, it's a post-apocalyptic world. So, there's two, but there's two characters, there's two groups of characters that we're going to follow, which is Caesar's world... And his and everyone related to him, his son, Blue Eyes, their friend Ash, and importantly, kind of Caesar's second in command, Koba, who's from the first film, a very physically and emotionally damaged uh, B- Bonobo. B- Bonbo, is that how you say it? He's such a powerful antagonist that they bring him back in the third film, even though he's killed in the second film. <laughs> oh, God, just spoilers, man. Spoilers. But that's okay. So Koba doesn't trust the humans. They learn that these humans are building. Um, Want to? Uh, well, the main the main pressure in the second film is that the is that the humans there's a hydroelectric dam in the apes territory, which if they can connect to that power, then they can bring electricity back to San Francisco and start to rebuild civilization. That's right. The. Uh- the dam's pretty much intact. It can probably start generating power for us within a week. But there's a problem. Get in. I shot him. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Jesus Christ. How many were there? There were a lot. There were like 80. At least. Okay, you're not hearing what he's saying. They spoke! That is not possible. I'm telling you, Dreyfus, they did. It was incredible. Incredible? They're talking apes with big-ass spears! Please! I don't know exactly what you think you saw or heard, but, but you have to calm down, okay? But to the point that you were making earlier is the reason why it doesn't feel so much as a system is that the humans are rebuilding or are building their civilization as much as the apes are. Yeah, and so also is- they're not interacting. They're not exerting power over each other. No, it's not designed. But yeah. the, I mean, maybe distrust is the theme, but essentially Koba doesn't trust the humans led by this Malcolm. And there are some humans, there's basically the Koba's opposite within the humans. This is a story of parallels. It's beautifully structured because you follow Malcolm is like Caesar. He wants the best for his people and he's willing to trust and cooperate. And he's offsider who he distrusts. I don't think they're friends in the same way that Koba and- and um, Caesar have a tight bond, but Ma- Dreyfus in the parallels. And then there's the whatever it is. What's his name? Severus, not Severus, Snapes. Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman's character back at in San Francisco. So, I'm just going to set up these parallels and there's a lot of stuff to be conflict. But ultimately, Cobra's distrust of the humans 
and Caesar's unwillingness to, not unwillingness, but his unwillingness to investigate what the human's up to. He's live and let live, leads Cobra to investigate what the human's doing, seeing that they're stockpiling weapons. And the reason they're stockpiling weapons is they don't trust humans, right? So it's about trust. It worked. Or at least here it did. We'll know when we get back to the city. Trust. I mean, it's, it is beautifully set up from the first film, I think, Caesar's Journey, because Caesar is the only one of those apes who has known kindness and love from humans. So, he does have a conflict there. Yes, and Caesar has very clear rules, which will- uh, about ape society. Ape not hurt ape. Ape. Apes together strong. Ape not hurt ape. That is what is going to make them different, right? And Cobra is the challenger of the that worldview. He's challenging Caesar's belief, his worldview, that trust and nonviolence is a way to live. And Malcolm is the same to his leader, uh, the Gary Oldman character, whoever he is, right? Ultimately, what happens is that Cobra intends to kill- Well, he does. He shoots Caesar and frames humans and leads- the apes into San Francisco and they basically plunder the armory and the mountain assault on the tower, right? Cobra is an absolute psycho, hell bent in destroying the humans. The, the, the turning point for Cobra as a, as a character in the film, and you can feel it, is that when Ash refuses Cobra orders to kill humans and he refers back to Caesar, Cobra throws Ash in a horrible moment, throws Ash over the, the edge of a, of a building to his death and any other, all the loyal loyalists to Caesar are imprisoned. And ultimately all this is happening. Cause basically what I'm trying to get to this story is the, there's a whole bunch of great stuff to do with the physical environment of the world, the parallel. I was complex. waiting for you to get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> you bitch. Um, <laughs> is that Caesar's pressured to make a decision, which is, does he give in and kill Cobra? Does he become the person, you know, does he break his own rules? Ape shall not kill ape. Does he break his own rules to regain power and to bring peace? Or does he not? Caesar has no place here. Apes follow Koba now. Follow Koba to war. Apes win war! Apes together strong! Caesar weak. Koba weaker. And basically what happens is Caesar rejects him. He Cobra does the submission gesture and, and Caesar doesn't take it and lets Cobra die. He doesn't push him off, but the fact is he's still complicit in Cobra's death. That is the choice that he makes. And, and it sets up the fil- third film beautifully, which is that they know that he, now a human military is coming because Malcolm was not able to convince because of Cobra's actions that the apes were peaceful. And that leads into the third film. But what is interesting about this film is the parallel structures, because it's about the showing this world and the way each of them deals with those conflicts, similarly to to Contagion. From but you've, part- you've articulated this beautifully from the characters' perspectives, particularly from Cobra, uh, sorry, from Caesar as a protagonist. But tell me why you wanted to talk about it in the context of the world being the antagonist, because it's the rules of the world. Because these systems are rules, right? Whether or not we're- Whether they're, they're artificially constructed, like Minority Report, or we're assuming they're artificially constructed in The Lobster, right? We- There's nothing- But like Mudbound, this is a link into Mudbound. How do you go from Minority Report to Mudbound in this film? 
because it's the same thing. These are the rules of their society and how they're ordered the people that things that they assume. And then Caesar is pressured by all these forces to give in, to break his own rules. His worldview is challenged. It's actually about worldview more than anything else. I mean, what's interesting about this f- film then is in particular the second one, which I think is actually the best of the trilogy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Is that Caesar is setting the rules. He is the leader. He is the architect of the rules of the world in the second film. Yeah. I mean, look, I just think it's- I do think I wanted to do it because I rewatched it recently before watching War of the Planet of the Apes. And I'm like, oh, man, this film is better than I remembered. It's the, the way the conflicts are, the interpersonal conflicts, the nature of conflicts, everything, how it's all thematically- Coherent, all about the need for trust and the desire for peace and the danger of violence and escalation. You know, mm. I mean, I don't, I don't think Caesar had any other choice to do what he did, and that's what, that's why it's a tragedy. Yeah, right. Oh, I agree with you, but I think f- f- looking, stepping back and looking at it from a craft perspective, what makes this film fascinating and different is the level of, you know, in Minority Report. John Anderton is not the architect of the rules. He's the enforcer of them. In The Lobster, Mm. they're not the architects of the rules. We don't even know who set the rules or when. They're just assumed. In Mudbound, it's never even questioned who has- whether racism should or should not exist, right? Whereas in- no, I think it's right. I, uh, well. We'll go into Mudbound. I think it's not just racism. I think it's white supremacy because white supremacy is an idea. And, uh, yes. And, um, and you should read the great article. I know this might be a trigger for a whole bunch of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> our first white on the on the first white president and the idea of what it being a system actually means. The Jim Crow laws were a fucking system, a self reinforcing. System. It wasn't just a bunch of people. It was people legitimately thinking about the supremacy of- Ah, ah, it gets me so angry. And on that note, we should transition. Yeah. And I think importantly, what we're getting to here is that what makes it a system, what makes it a world, what makes it the protagonist, the story, the narrative story of the protagonist being pitted against those systems or being pitted against that world is from a dramatic level- is that there are rules. You talk about Jim Crow laws, they are the rules enacted by an underlying belief. They are the dramatization of it. I think the tragedy of, and, and this relates to Mudbound, which as you say, is it's kind of, it, it is rules. But I think what makes the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is there is a sense of inevitability of what is going to happen at the end of that film. I think you, once Cobra shoots Caesar, you're like, oh, fuck. Like, the goal is for Caesar, how do I stop Cobra? But he realizes he has to become the thing that he hates. He has to break his own rules to try to protect the system, his world, which is the world of the apes. But that sets in a chain. It, the whole thing has set up a chain of events, um, which I guess makes it relevant to, to the world. It makes it a little bit more unique in the other films because, no, I think I think it's there's a never- there, actually, I'm going to say no. I think there is an, ele- an inevitability, a tragedy, and an inevitability in Mudbound. More than the lobster. Yeah, definitely. Violence is part and parcel of country life. I learned how to stitch up a bleeding wound, load and fire a shotgun. My hands did these things, but I was never easy in my mind. Way down in the water. I held his heartbeat in my head. Way down in the hall. All that time he was gone, I only prayed for him. Over there, I was a liberator. People lined up in the streets waiting for us. Sometimes I actually miss it. Yeah, me too. I'm coming back from the fire. You the one I always talking about. I own and I own a parcel. The only way to get up from under that foot. Crawling back from the side. I don't want you working for them. I won't be working for them. I'll be working for us. Coming back from the fire. To fight for my country to come back and find ahead and change a bit. I don't know what they let you do over there, but you in Mississippi now. You use the back door. Before we get into this, uh, for any of our listeners who haven't seen Mudbound yet, 
please be warned that it deals with a whole lot of racially motivated violence and racism. I mean, that's really what the film is about. And we do use some excerpts from the film that uses some very offensive language. If you'd like, feel free to skip forward to the next section, which deals with the lobster. Mudbound is a period film, as we've mentioned before. It's set in rural Mississippi, and it's set around World War II, just before and just after. And it and during. <laughs> and during, yeah. A, a certain period of time around World War II in kind of like a fictionalized town, but within Mississippi and the Mississippi Delta. And there's two families, uh, Henry McAllen and- is played by <laughs> Jason, Jason Clark. Clark. <laughs> this is lots of same actors in this in this episode. Jason Clark, gosh. Um, particularly as we're going to be talking about doing a Samantha Morton film in the next episode. Jason Clark playing a very different character with Henry McAllen. His wife Laura, who is Carrie McGulli- Mulligan, who's making another repeat appearance on our antagonist series. And there, he's a very racist father, Pappy. He's also got a brother. Uh, I think it's Jason. What's his brother's name? Jamie? Jamie. That that sounds right. And then meanwhile, we're following the Jackson family, uh, which is the farmer Hap, his wife Florence, and their children, the key one of which is Ronzel. Right. So coming back to the- There's some obstacle stuff. The film opens with what we realize is like an in, in men's ra, but sets up the tensions and is actually a really great, a great example of just obstacles at work, which is um, Jamie and Henry are trying to bury what we think is their father. And they find basically that the grave that they're trying to put him in quickly before it rains, pressure, is a slave's grave. What is it? It's a slave's grave. How do you know that? Shot in the head. Must have been a runaway. Uh, that settles it. Settles what? I ain't burying my father in no slave's grave. Nothing he would have hated more. Um, which means it's unmarked. There is literally... <laughs> I mean, the film is making symbolic points very strongly. Mm-hmm. There is literally the bones of slaves in this unmarked grave, and Pappy would not be happy with that, but Jamie insists. We ain't got choice. And then... This black family. Um, uh, uh, the- you, you're missing the bit where where the brother almost lets Jamie drown in the grave. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's raining and they're trying to bury it, and and you're like, oh god, is Henry going to let him drown in the grave? And he he lets him out, and then the family, the Jackson family, is coming nearby, and they basically ask for their help to bury this person that we are pretty convinced is a, a you know a racist. Kind of like a a, a southern, um, you know, and what we'll learn is a Ku Klux Klan member. Um, and Jackson Pap buries him. That's kind of the opening thing. And it sets up all the tensions in this film and this idea, as the name says, this mud blown, that this stuff is connected to land and history and goes on. There is so much to unpack in this film. Yeah, I, that- I think as a way of tackling it, should we tackle it in the same way that we tackled Contagion in terms of looking at the the f- for like the main characters and how the world is their antagonist and what, okay, yes. how they what their journey is in that context. But unlike Contagion, Contagion, Contagious, unlike that film, I don't think there is a, the, the world is a single antagonist. But I think the way it antagonizes the character is different. It is not as singular as a virus. I think. The pressures on all these characters coming from the world, it, it is connected. I think it is brought, you could see it as a system or a kind of an historical system of a social, it's a social order, but I don't yeah. think it's, it's singular. So, it, it is different. It's the role of women, the role, of the, 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 the expectations of women, expectations of white women versus black women, brothers versus um Land, you know, land odors, the implication of World War II, there is a ton of them going on. I mean, this is a very loaded material, but ultimately leads to very particular choices by the characters at the very I mean, end me, of the film. Me saying, yes. I think if you look at it as any kind of 
unfair prejudicial power imbalance reinforced by a society. Yeah. So it's not just that an individual is prejudicial, it's that the society reinforces that prejudice. And corrects their enforcers of that prejudice that maintain that maintain the system. There are maintainers. There are maintainers yeah. in Monari Report, the pre crime cops themselves after Aderton. But there are the, kind of the maintainers of the of the system, even in Dawn of the Planet Apes, those that were like, we can't trust the apes or those that we can't trust the humans. Yeah. The kind of the maintainers of that world. Yeah. So, interestingly, as soon as that sort of cold open, it does a, a Stuart special. Not named after me. <laughs> named after Stuart Friedel of Script Notes fame. After that cold open, it then goes into... Laura, played by Kerry Mulligan's point of view, she provides a voiceover. And I actually think if we ever do our long debated voiceover episode, uh, this would be one of a good contender. It's from her point of view as Henry is wooing her. And it's ultimately, they, they seem to be either upper middle class, wealthy, well-to-do white people who are such as that society can, falling in love with each other. My world was small, and he was my rescuer from a life in the margins. Really? He tells me that um, you are actually a college man. Engineer. An engineering degree from Ole Miss? Yes. Do you know that law and engineering degree from Ole Miss? My, my, my. Now, Laura is a college graduate. She got her teaching certificate from West Tennessee State. We're very proud of her. Mm Mm-hmm. And... He's the force of antagonism on her as soon as he decides that he wants to be a farmer and move to this land in Mississippi. And by the way, I bought a farm in Mississippi. And we'll be moving there in three weeks' time. It's 40 miles south of Greenville. Big old... Porch, fig tree. Girls are gonna love it. Four bedrooms. But we love this house. Now they get their own room each. Pappy gets his own space. Pappy? Honey, now mum is gone. We gotta look after him. We got 200 acres of fertile land. Imagine that. I'm mighty quiet. I'm mighty surprised. You always knew I want to own a farm someday. No. I told you. Henry, I had no idea. I'm up. I would have remembered that. All these characters provide different, I think, perspectives on the spectrum of prejudice. I don't think Henry sees himself as a racist or even an enabler of prejudice, but he certainly is the character that never questions his privilege. And when his privilege is questioned, he reinforces it. And so it does that through his relationship with, as you said, Hap, the black family next door, because they're tenants, aren't they? They're- yes. They rent the land from yeah. him, but they work the fa- farm as well. It's like that yeah. double-edged, mm. which is how the Grim- Jim Crow's laws worked. It's a, it's a power structure to, in- to maintain, to stop- black families from being landowners. Yep. Right? And and you see that that when Hap injures his leg, Henry moves in. You all ought to be willing to plant him by now and you haven't even gotten your fields laid by. Can't afford to wait any longer, Hap. You're a farmer. You understand that? Yes, sir. Of course, if you had a mule, you'd be done in no time. We lost a mule to Lockjaw, sir. I know. Florence and the boys out there. You have to rent one of my mules, Hap. You're going half shares till you pay it off. Or, you know, to gain an economic advantage, to reinforce Hap's inferiority and maintain his position as a indentured tenant rather than as a free land ho- landowner. Mm. And so Henry gives us this perspective because he's starts out as being the attractive character 
for Carrie Mulligan and never doesn't seem early on in the film to have prejudicial points of view, but as it progresses and whenever Henry is forced to make a choice, he does make a choice to reinforce his privilege and to protect his privilege. Yeah. So, it's almost like the obstacles and the antagonistic forces to Henry are, are you going to rise above this? We feel the pressure forces on him are his father, Pappy, his racist father, and poverty. But he makes certain choices in reaction to that. Mm. And Henry is always asking of the Jackson family, but they're tenants. They can't say no. Not very- Oh, yeah. Hard. I mean- Very hard. I'm, I'm being very kind to Henry- Early on in the film in that Henry has a lot of unspoken expectations of Hap. Like the very meeting of Henry and Hap is Henry walking in on Hap's family dinner and expecting Hap to get up and help him unload his furniture and move into the house. Yes. So, I'm not- I'm by no means suggesting that Henry was a paragon of equity early on in the film. <laughs> But it's interesting to see that, you know, you could kind of, in a way, forgive that as as Henry's cultured upbringing. It's just that when talking about antagonistic forces and the rules of the world, that whenever Henry is expected to make a choice, he falls on the side of actually reinforcing the idea of white supremacy. So, Where in contrast to his brother. Yes. And that's significant. The film is showing that there is another way to, of being, which is Jamie, yes. his brother. Um, and so, look, the film is kind of divided. I think maybe the first act kind of doesn't matter. The film is kind of a little bit Terrence Malick, a little bit episodic, a little bit dreamy. It is a really interesting film to watch is that- when World War Two, with the attack on Pearl Harbor, Jamie commission is commissioned and Ronzel enlists. And we break away to their POVs. So we see Ronzel commanding a tank. We see Ronzel having a romance with a white woman. We can see him. He's being treated with respect, you know, as he is someone that he's fighting for his country, a country which treated him shit. And now he, he is, lib you know, liberating Europe. Whereas Jamie's experience is quite different. He's flying a bomber. His um, co-pilot is like splatters brains all over him. You know, they both have off suffer like the World War II them itself is a antagonist. It's a pressure on those two characters that forces them yep. to change. And it's and it's interestingly World War II is presented as an antagonist to those characters almost as a nature antagonist in that they have no control and no negotiation. And it's interesting how the f the film plays that. I think from budgetary reasons, they've got very limited ways of mm. showing Jamie and Ronzel's experience of World War II, but they only ever show Ronzel's family waiting fearfully for his safe return. They never show uh, Laura or Henry or Pappy, the white family, waiting desperately for Jamie's return, safe return. No, and I think- I actually think before getting into Jamie and Ronzel, we should touch briefly on Laura, Henry's wife. Yes. Because, okay, so we essentially have probably- the, the main POV characters are Henry, Laura, I'd say Hap, Florence, who's Hap's wife, and Ronzel. I don't think Pappy is- a point of view character at all. He's almost like a shark. He's he is an anta pure antagonist to everyone, yeah. particularly Laura. I mean, he's still an antagonist to Henry. Well, I, I would say particularly Ronzel. <laughs> but if oh. we if we're going to say who he's the greatest source of antagonism to, but yes, yes. he's a source um, of antagonism to everyone in the film. So Lara obviously has to deal with the fact that she's a wife in in a in a world that yes, women had suffrage and all that stuff, but is not doesn't have much power, does not have much financial power. She's been married to Henry and it's a bit passionless. She, he's taken her to somewhere she does not like particularly. And she had a moment of attraction with Jamie when they were dancing that Henry noticed, but Henry still proposed to her because Jamie likes all the girls, even though he made Laura feel special. Um, and so she had some very specific um, 
a couple of specific obstacles. She suffers a miscarriage and then she calls on Florence from the Jacksons to kind of be yeah, her I- comfort. Hmm? I I think in terms of talking about how her sources of antagonism are with the world, Laura is someone who, who as a white character, doesn't see her race as privileging herself, such that she her relationship is primarily with Florence, such that they she calls on Florence, she wants to um employ Florence to make her own life better initially, but importantly, she undermines her own husband by paying for a doctor to come and see Hap's leg. 8, 30, 62. The date the Confederate forces crushed the Union Army in the Battle of Richmond. I don't think he knew that I knew the combination. Hello, Mrs. Jackson. Yes? I am Dr. Perlman. I'm here to treat your husband. Oh, thank you. Come in. If you would have asked me before then, I'd have told you all white folks was the same. And her relation by doing that it in turn is a source of antagonism on Florence to not see Laura as a white person but rather as a is not Does clearly it? stated but as a woman more so i think florence realizes the dilemma that she's been put in <laughs> which is that she has to put Laura's well-being over the well-being of her own family because yeah, I'm, I'm kind of jumping it. across different sequences. Mm. That's definitely there's definitely a beat of that where you hear in Florence's voiceover okay. th- that that's her decision. So what do you think? I mean, we're just trying to run through them a little bit scattered, but I think what makes them focused is they're all given specific choices. The antagonistic forces pressure the the characters in the film to make key key choices, which I think in the case of Laura manifests in a couple of these moments. So when she decides to pay for the doctor, she she overrules Henry, undermines him by paying for the doctor. But also when there's a moment when she eventually gives into her passion for Jamie and sleeps with him. And then then and this, and we'll get to Jamie, there's basically her reaction to what Jamie's final choice is. So I'm gonna skip to to Jamie. I mean, I think Laura is a great point of view character. Um and she is very all these sorts of all all of these characters' journeys, as they are dramatized, can be phrased in terms of does this action, does this binary choice that the antagonistic forces are pushing these characters to making support or undermine the idea of white supremacy? Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think Henry's final choice is? Because we've kind of moved on for Henry, but I want to come back to that. What well, do you it's think it's interesting his final because I think his final choice is actually his in terms of the decisions that he makes as in decisions that he's presented with they happen much earlier like the end of the film Henry has become almost a non-character. Yeah, he actually disappears from the plot. He leaves. He yeah. leaves the farm <laughs> when the most significant events, the events that actually bring the other characters together, yeah. um, happens. And and so, I think, unfortunately, we got to jump to that because it is the big end of the film, but it kind of is the focus of all the characters' journeys, which but is- I, I, can, I, can I answer your question about Henry? Mm-hmm. He comes to someone who is forced through the pressures of antagonism, be they economic pressures or- or him chasing his goal to be a farmer, a successful farmer, mm. to be an enforcer of white supremacy. Henry. Yeah. Yeah. And it and it happens in those middle sections of the film that we've discussed. He succumbs to the he yeah. succumbs to the system. Or he's part of it. He never challenges us. Even to Mr. McCall. Even in Hap. Lawrence. It's our son Ronzel, I told you about. Yeah, we already met. Hep, I'd better speak to you alone. <laughs> Not a child, son. 
Anything you can say to my daddy, you can say in front of me. All right, then. You're asking for a whole heap of trouble, acting the way you did at Triple Banks earlier. Now, I know you don't want that kind of trouble. Not for yourself, or for your family. Well, what'd you do? He couldn't have done anything. I just, I just tried to walk out the door. As the front door. When my father, another man, corrected him, he gave a fine speech, put us all in our places, didn't you? It's interesting that once he's succumbed to the system, he ceases to be relevant as a character to the narrative. Yeah, to the point that he leaves during this crucial event. Yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump forward to that because I think this technique has worked. Is the event that kind of brings together the stories of Laura and Pappy and Jamie and Ronzel and in, and Happy and like everyone is that what we learn is that Ronzel's romance in the white with the the woman in Germany, which was actually German. I thought she was Belgian, but anyway. Well, that's true. It could be Belgian. Um, has resulted in a child. He's got a mixed race child and he shows Jamie while sitting in the front seat because him and Jamie have become good friends at this point. And then Ronzel realizes that he has left the photo in the front seat with Jamie and there Pappy has found it. So Pappy's well, the, the super yeah. racist. In in the lead up to that, okay. let me just quickly say that Jamie and Ronzel both come back from World War II and as veterans find more solace in each other than anyone else around them. <laughs> you ever miss it sometimes, being over there? I don't mean being shot at, but sometimes I actually miss it. Yeah, me too. Over there, I was a liberator. People lined up in the streets waiting for us. Throwing flowers and chill. And here, I'm just another nigga pushing a plow. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think I was going to talk about the same. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and I get what you're saying about the ending, but I'm just saying that it undermines the idea of white supremacy because they both end up drinking with each other and becoming friends with each other, but they still have to hide their relationship. And it's Jamie's actions directly lead to the consequence that you want to talk about. Jamie demands the Ronzel drive up in the front of the car with him because he sees him as an equal, but the world around them doesn't see them that way. And it's Pappy seeing Ronzel driving up in the front of the car with Jamie that leads to this final climax. Okay. And as you say, Ronzel- Yeah. So- As you said, Ronzel has left that letter in the car, which indicates- that gives that Pappy finds out that Ronzel has slept with a white woman, and that's resulted in a child, and so he gains he gets the Ku Klux Klan together, and lynches Ronzel brutally beats him, and then Pappy gets Jamie because he wants to teach Jamie a message, and he forces Jamie to witness <laughs> the trial, um before they go through the final punish- uh, punishment of Ronzel. And Jamie tries to fight people off. He threatens to kill Pappy, but ultimately Pappy gives ja- uh, Jamie a choice about Ronzel's punishment, which is that Jamie is to decide whether Ronzel loses his eye, his tongue, or his testicles. And if Jamie does not choose, they will kill Ronzel. And these guys are fearless. There is no sense that they believe will be any repercussions to their actions. And I would say that Jamie does give in. Like, he's obviously hating this choice that he's put under, but Jamie is ultimately not prepared to give his life to to avoid making this choice. And it's also Jamie's hubris and lack of care for what would happen to Ronzel that has led to this. Yes, his need for a friend. Yes. His, his, literally his lack of access to privilege makes him not understand 
just the consequences of their sins. And I think Ronzel, they try to get Ronzel to make choices within this scene as well. Get him to confess, to apologize. So Ronzel's also given choices about how he views his own action and Ronzel is proud and refuses to back down. Yeah. Which is why they kick to to Jamie. And then Jamie chooses to have Ronzel have his tongue taken. Yeah. And then they strung up Ronzel for his family to discover. And later that night, Jamie makes the the other key choice. This is the this is the escalation. I know we've jumped to the end. Jamie Well, no, I think it's important in these in discussions of antagonistic forces to actually, actually discuss the Yeah. To discuss how the film ends. Jamie smothers Pappy with a pillow, smothers him to death. I wanted to make sure I looked you in the eye. And then Laura realises the next morning that's what's happened. And her choice is that when Henry, who's been conveniently missing mm-hmm. for this third mm-hmm. act, turns up. It's your father. He died last night. How? In a sleep. Peacefully. She chooses to lie to him. And then we see Happen Florence taking care of Ronzel. And then we are re-brought back to the opening of the film when they are burying Pappy in the farm. And Happen Florence have Ronzel lying in the, the underneath their cart. Yeah, that's the dramatic irony is that we know that Henry is about to come up and ask in an expectant fashion that Hap helped them when Hap knows that he's got his disfigured, almost murdered son under the cart. So, this is dramatic irony in that the audience knows all this, but but Henry doesn't. That, that Ronzel has been disfigured because of this man and Henry has no awareness of it because he's- I guess his thing is he's unaware. He is so- of his privilege, mm. being, I think he's the eldest son as well, um, mm. of his privilege that he doesn't ask any questions and he is expectant. And I think that is, it doesn't say much about Henry, but we understand Jamie, Jamie never cared for his father particularly. And the father has challenged him throughout. But what are the pressures on these characters that have led them all to make this decision? That is, as you say, a really good point. And I think it makes it easier to focus. Ronzel has come back from World War II and he is like, I fought for this fucking country. I nearly died. I experienced a a life kind of separate from racism. I was a tank commander. He comes back to Mississippi and very early on, he enters through the front door of a shop to buy something with money. He has money. He is empowered, right? He gets a sergeant's pay. He's a fucking officer. And he- Buy some goods from this shop. Non commissioned. <laughs> well, yeah. Mm-hmm. But he still should demand a degree of respect that he, yeah. his family has been struggling so hard to have. And I think, you know, World War II did help push the civil rights movement. This is, I started reading up on it. This was true. Like it helped push the change because of what happened with these soldiers over there. Pappy, this is Ronzel. Happened Florence's son just returned from overseas. Oh, oh, oh. Well, that explains why you're trying to leave by the front door. You must be confused as to your whereabouts. No, sir, I'm not confused at all. Oh, I think you are, boy. I don't know what they let you do over there, but you're in Mississippi now. You use the back door. Go on, son. Son, we don't want no trouble here. Go on. Go on. You know what? You're absolutely right. When we was overseas, they didn't make us use the back door. General Patton put us on the front line. Yes, sir. And you know what we did? We kicked the hell out of Hitler and them jazz. And Ronzel chooses. To, he, he's, he, it's a choice, but he knows it's a choice because Henry basically comes in at that point and warns him and says, you need to submit to the system. You're back in, basically, you're back in Mississippi by know your place. Mm. You use yeah. the back door. This is the beginning of the pressures on Ronzel. Yeah, and the uh, Henry later goes to Hap and gets Hap 
to force Ronzel to apologize to Pappy. So he gets Hap to be an enabler essentially of the system, whereas Ronzel is trying to fight it. So let's talk about just very briefly, we've we've gone through all the like major beats of the film, but Henry's journey is one to become an enabler of the system from someone who, you know, perhaps didn't care one way or another. I, I I don't I don't think he has much of a journey now. Think about it. I think Henry's like Pappy. Mm. He's just complicit yeah. and complacent. Yeah, I I have he agree he with that. he enables mm. Laura and Jamie. The film is more interested in them. Mm. That's what's so clever yeah. about the film. We mm. think we're following Henry. Yeah, but really his story kind of mm. finishes, and he's just there to be the enforcer. Yeah, and then uh, I think Laura and Florence are interestingly the most positive representations in terms of the world as an antagonist in that they're the the two actual characters who rise above the rules of the world and manage to act in ways that the world does not permit. Then you've got Jamie who doesn't care about the rules of the world until the world slaps him back so hard, but he is so privileged and so ignorant of his privilege, so ignorant of the rules of the world that he brings destruction down on Ronzel who also came back home and, as you said, saw that the rules of the world didn't apply to him and then the rules of the world struck him down so hard that he ended up getting lynched and having his tongue cut out. Yeah. And I think this film is so powerful and so amazing because of that way of enunciating the film, that all of these characters' journeys, as you say, it's episodic, it's dreamy, it's- but it's cohesive because of that, because of how these people act in relation to the rules of the world. And history, you know, Jackson, sorry, Hap, Hap Jackson talks about his parents and his parents before them and what he wants to leave his children. We get the sense of continuity in the shadow of the history and the realization that it wasn't that long ago. Mm. <laughs> it really wasn't. It was only a couple of mm. generations. And that's where we could be again. Yes. If we're not careful. And these systems can be insidious and invisible. Yeah. I think what this film does really well for the for the white characters is, other than Pappy, the Jamie, Henry, and Laura don't see the system. That's their privilege. Yeah. I mean, I think it- I think, <laughs> uh, Again, trigger word for some- and the film is intersectional in the sense that Laura's experience of being a white woman are very different from Henry's experience from being a white man, but also very different and in intersectional and identity politics, for lack of a better word, because it's also saying those experiences are different from um, Florence mm. being a black and woman. Hap. And Hap. And then of their generation, you know, because it ends with Hap actually buying his own- farm, you know, I th- you get the feeling that they're going to break out of it, but these things take time and the film ends, hopefully, unlike the novel, the novel, this didn't happen. The end of the film is Ronzel mute, but Ronzel finding a way to get to Germany and meeting his wife and his son. And it's quite a few years yet, or it looks like three years later that he made it. There is a sense of hope at the end of the film. Yeah, definitely. I mean, sense of tragedy, but it's definitely optimistic. Like, the fact that it ends with Ronzel mutilated, but going to meet his interracial son and uh, and embrace a life where he is not defined by his race is, yeah, very optimistic, given wow. everything that we've seen before. Look, this is a hard film to articulate, partly because the structure itself isn't as clearly shaped. Like, Minari Report is very plot-driven, you know. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is plot-driven once those plots kick into gear, you know. All the stuff to do with the dam, all the stuff about killing, you know, got to reclaim 
go in and kill, you stop Cobra and all that stuff. Mud Bounty is a lot more nebulous and you can hear us talking about it as nebulous, but it's unified through that world experience of the characters. And I, I think I should have said this at the beginning, but I kind of need to acknowledge that the difficulty of talking about a film that's about the historical experience of people that are, you know, of black Americans in like Southern Mississippi and white Americans, poor white Americans in Southern Mississippi as an Australian white male. Like I'm mm. very far removed from those experience, you know? Yeah. So I kind of only can kind of take the text on face value and for, for better or for worse, rather than in terms of there's possibly a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm missing from the film and not doing justice to, but it's on Netflix. Go and watch it. Yeah. I imagine we may have a lot of uh, African-American listeners screaming into their phones like, wake up, you idiots. That's not what the film is about at all. And if they do, please send in your <laughs> feedback. We'll play it. Um, yeah. I think it's time to move on to the lobster. Mm. Most definitely looking at how long we've been recording for. Um, which again, which unlike One Bound is very- is very focused. In, in fact, I think what is very interesting about The Lobster is how, for an art house film, how very plot, plotty and goal orient, goal orientated it is. Any children? No. And the dog? Yeah. This is my brother. He was here a couple of years ago, but he didn't make it. Good morning. 44 days left. Breakfast is served. As you understand from your brother's experience. If you fail to fall in love with someone during your stay here, you'll turn into an animal. Would you like to dance? Mind if I join you? It's no coincidence that the targets are shaped like single people and not couples. <laughs> Just a heads up to our listeners that the lobster has some very sexually explicit language. So once again, if that's not your bag, feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter on high school movies. Have you thought of what animal you'd like to be if you end up alone? Yes, a lobster. A lobster is an excellent choice. Do you, do you want to try and summarize the lobster or shall I? I think the lobster is really easy to sim- summarize in that- Basically, and it will tell you this, it's a, I mean, it's absurdist. I mean, this film is so bricked in, right down to the Mm. performance style. It's very absurdist, dystopian black comedy. Uh, Co-directed, co-written by Yorgos Lenithema, I'm just going to ruin his name. Mm. And it's basically set in a world where, in in a near future world, in a world where single people are given 45 days. So, in this world, single people are given 45 days to find a romantic p- partner or they're going to be turned into animals and set free. That is the setup of the film. Colin Farrell, David, is our kind of- He's our- He's not our protagonist. I, I guess he kind of is. But the very first instance is something that happens to him. Which is his wife chooses to leave him for another man. And therefore, David is arrested and escorted to this mysterious hotel, which is kind of like a really scary Grand Budapest hotel. Mm. And that's when we learn the kind of more of the rules of the world. The hotel manager will say, you've got 45 days to find a partner or you'll be turned into an animal. And we learn that the dog that is accompanying David is his brother who failed the last time. Yeah. And so basically the first half of the film is David in the rules, the very particular rules and rituals of this hotel trying to find a partner. And when he realizes that he's going to be unable to, he escapes and obviously spoilers, um, escapes into the forest where he runs into the loners and the loners are the inverse of the people in the hotel. The loners are allowed to not have relationships. By the way, any romantic or sexual relations between loners are not permitted and any such acts are punished. Is that clear? Can I have a conversation with someone? Of course you can. So long as there is no flirting or anything like that. That applies to dance nights as well. We all dance by ourselves. That's why we only play electronic music. What happened to your mouth? 
He can't speak. He was given the red kiss. What's the red kiss? We slashed his lips with the razor and the lips of another loner and we forced him to kiss each other. That was a couple of days ago now. But the cuts were deep and they're still in pain. They were flirting, you know. Well, can I can I clarify one point? Because it's not that he arbitrarily bumps into them. No, he doesn't. He, he, he seeks them out. Well, the people who are staying in the hotel can win extra days before they are turned into an animal. So, they win more opportunity to find love and to escape this fate by hunting down loners in the forest. An extra day for each person. So, he, he's fully where there exists. So, he, when he escapes the hotel, he makes a choice to mm. hunt them down. And then we see this- mm. And we don't really understand who the loners are until he joins them. I think one of the the wonderful things that this film does is the information about the rules of the world it chooses to reveal and the information it chooses to just say, you make up your own mind as an audience member how this works. And I think what is also great about the loners is initially you think they might be the kind of rebellion the, the freedom fighters in this universe, but they're not. They're just another system. They are the yep. anti-system, but they're still a system. Exactly. And the ultimate choice, let's start there. The ultimate choice that David has presented is will he stab himself, will he blind himself with a steak knife in order to be with the woman that he's now falling in love with? That is the dramatic question that the film mm. ends mm. with, mm. that pressure mm. him him into that point. But the, the the antagonism in this is is fantastic. I mean, we've obviously got the pressure cooker of the 45 days, a very clear goal. And then, then a whole bunch of weird rules of the world. So, the maid comes in and rubs herself against all the, all the, the, the single people in order to get them aroused, but they're not allowed to masturbate. And if they do, they get their hands put in a toaster. I imagine you know that masturbation is not permitted in the rooms or any other area of the hotel. Yes. And yet it has been brought to my attention that you continue to do it. Were you looking at a photograph while you were masturbating? Yes. What did the photograph show? A naked woman on a horse in the country. If I were in your shoes, I would not be ogling the naked woman, but the horse. I'm sure that horse was once a weak and cowardly man just like you. This is not necessary, please. It was an accident. I just got carried away. This is not necessary. Please, place your hand in the toaster. This could be a warning. I've been good otherwise. I mean, like you said, it's it's wonderfully absurdist, but you do very much get the the dread that this the oppression this that this world enforces on the people. You know that they their their choices seem to be either find love and adhere to the rules of this world, or, or you're expelled, get turned into an animal, or you become you are expelled and you become a loner. No, I mean, I, they don't turn you in. You're expelled as an animal. If you choose, yeah. you can run away and be a loner, but then we'll hunt you and turn you into an animal and you won't get to choose what animal you are. The, the title of the film refers to the animal that Colin Farrell's character chooses to, to be turned into. Um, one of the most fascinating bits of the film for me, and look, I think I I skew as a, a literate film goer I'm always interested in the rules of the world, and that's why I think this particular part of this exploration interests me. But when they are, when he's joined the loners, one of the ways that they economically support themselves, because they, they, they're, they're out in the woods living by themselves. And as you say, it's another system where they're allowed and even encouraged to masturbate, but they are not allowed to fall in love because it's- the rules of the loners has to be in rebellion to the rules of the prevailing society. But in order to get the necessities that they need to live, they dress themselves up as normal people, clean themselves up, do their hair, get dressed in normal clothes and pretend to be couples and walk into the city 
to buy essentials. And the bits when they're in the city pretending to be couples is amazing to me because it it shows what is the the ultimate objective of this society. Like, let's say in the hotel, if he'd actually found love early on, he would have gone out into this society to be allowed to function relatively normally. But they're in this shopping mall and the cops come and query you. Good morning, sir. Are you here alone? Good morning, officer. No, I'm here with my partner. She's inside one of the stores shopping right now. Can I see your certificate, please? My partner keeps it in her purse. You see, I am losing it all the time. I see. And what store is she shopping in? Oh, here she is. I'm sorry, darling. They had such a huge variety of pain relief ointment. I bought you this one. I hope it's the one you were looking for. That's wonderful, dear. Can I have my certificate, please? Of course, darling. Would you like to see mine also, officer? No, that's okay. Rather than targeting terrorists or people in hoodies or racially profiling, they're there to target single people to make sure that they're not functioning outside of the societal rules. Yes, that is good. I'm going to jump back to the first half of the film. Yeah. Because this relates to pressures. And also something we haven't talked about that much, which is lies and secrets, you know, being a form of pressure on the character and a very good, just a very simple way to make, like, put characters in dilemmas. Um, But one thing I want to say is at no point does this character, do we ever feel that overcoming, challenging the system is possible? I guess we feel that maybe the loners, because they hunt these loners, we think, oh, he can escape and become a loner. And then what we discover is that the loner is loners are their own system and so really there's no escape except maybe becoming an animal um does very good job of having enforcement but parallel so there's another character played by ben wishaw and we don't really know the names of these characters i think he's just called nosebleed man or something um there's robert who's played for john c Riley. so nosebleed man um we call him that because he fought he's got a, a limp and he wants to and his wife had a limp but she's dead now and he needs to find someone else you guests arrived yesterday? Yes, I saw. I think I saw a woman with a limp. It's just a sprained ankle. She'll be walking normally again in a few days. That's a shame. And he ends up liking this girl who gets random nosebleeds, and basically he starts um, hitting himself against things, forcing himself to fake nosebleeding so he can connect with the nosebleed woman. And it works, and they go to the next level. There are levels in this. They go to a hotel room together to prove that they take their relationship to the next level. And everyone's like, there is such a good match because he also has nosebleeds. And this is a theme of the film, looking for your appropriate match. But it's all on very, like, almost Tinder, like, superficiality. Yeah. I mean, I love that one of the levels is that they give them as a couple to see if they're going to work as a couple. They give them a child. They put them under pressure. (laughs) And then they put them on a yoke by themselves to put them under pressure. Um, I mean, this whole film is making a comment on what is love in our contemporary society. Like, is love a construct? But anyway, yeah, sorry, I interrupted. There's, um, yeah, and and we see a lot of the rules of the world through these characters, like Robert John C. Riley. He's caught masturbating, so he burns his hand. There is another woman, desperate, um, to who's like into butter biscuits, desperate for anyone to be with her. One night on the coach, he sat next to the woman who liked butter biscuits. He gazed out of the window, not looking at anything in particular, just trying to avoid talking to her. How's Bob? He's fine. Give anything to go for a walk with you and Bob one afternoon. The dog's not allowed out of the room, I'm afraid. There are some excuses that no one can argue with, he thought. Some excuses are without doubt better than others. And that was a really good one. These biscuits are for Bob. I want you to give them to him whenever you want to reward him for something. Tell him they're from me. Thank you. Can I come to your room sometime for a chat? I could give you a blowjob. Or you could just fuck me. 
I always swallow off deflation and I've got absolutely no problem with anal sex if that's your thing. Everyone kind of, her desperation kind of turns everyone off, even though they know she's going to turn into an animal. And she calls Colin Farrell, David, and he doesn't answer because he's not around. And, and she basically says she's going to, had said earlier that she's going to jump off a building, the building to kill herself rather than become an animal. And during that time, David has decided that he's going to win the affections of the heartless woman. We've been told that she's heartless. And so the whole thing, and he's, been in, he's been inspired. Yeah. Yeah. We've been shown that she's heartless because she beats up a loner. He's been inspired by John's seduction of the nosebleed woman by faking nosebleeding by David deciding to pretend that he is also heartless. And this is a series of escalation that pressure his commitment to pretend to be heartless. This is this is a beautiful sequence in terms of pressuring and antagonistic forces. Yeah. So basically, he's I don't even say a friend. The butter biscuit woman jumps out of the building and horribly is lying on the ground with a pool of blood, but she's not completely dead and she's screaming out. And David uses that as the opportunity to start mm. talking mm. to the heartless woman. To demonstrate about- how heartless he is. Yes. And then he later joins her in a jacuzzi and she has like an olive from her martini and then starts choking and he just does nothing. I think we are a match. Yes, I think so too. See, those two things already challenge his commitment, but they're not that hard. Like, they're escalating. And then there is a, another great little moment where they run into Nosebleed Man and Nosebleed Woman. This is our new daughter. Her name's Elizabeth. Elizabeth, give the nice man a kiss. He's a friend of mine. The last thing I want right now is a kiss from a silly little girl. And David is like, I hate kids and affection, and kicks her on the <laughs> knee, right? <laughs> Don't cry, Elizabeth. You should thank me. Now you'll have a limp and be more like your father. But that scene is challenging his commitment to this lie. It's pressuring him. The obstacle over the course of the, the the goal over the course of the sequence is to win the heartless woman's affection so they can go on and get out of the hotel. And there is a series of obstacles in the way of that. But some of them, like her ch- fake choking, he doesn't actually have to actively do something, but it's a source of pressure. And then this leads to the final scene with him and the heartless woman, because she's not 100% convinced. And then she basically tells him how she killed David's brother in dog form and how he was whimpering and dying. And you're like, I wonder if she's, I wonder if she's bullshitting. And he goes into the bathroom to find his brother in dog form brutally murdered by the heartless woman. Yeah. And then she go and he's crying and she's like, well, this is a lie. And she intends to drag him to the hotel manager and that he's going to get punished by putting in, being turned into another animal. And at this point he makes the decision to escape all those pressures built up and they got escalated and escalated. So when she killed her brother, he couldn't pretend anymore that he wasn't the person that she needed him to be, which was heartless. And it comes this beautiful little sequence of him escaping and eventually shooting the heartless woman and turning into into an animal. And then that leads him to joining loners in the woods. That's the big decision for the middle of the film. Can I articulate those initial sequences in terms of rules of the, the world or him in, in contrast to the world as an antagonist? The first sequence, he's largely passive. He's been picked up by police. He's been put into mm. the, the hotel- He's doing what everyone is telling him to do, right? Yes. But that second sequence- He's following the rules. Yes. The second sequence, he's very active. He's still following the rules and pursuing what the the social diktat says that he should be pursuing, but he's active in it. You've just described the great lengths against such massive antagonistic Mm -hmm. pressures that he goes to- to adhere to the rules of the world until he breaks and at the midpoint says, I'm not going to adhere to the rules of this world anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to escape. Now that's beautifully articulated. And so if you think what's the, in a society of loners where they, um, the leader are played by, I can't, Lee Sadu. I can't speak French at all. So, uh, the, 
Yes. Uh, so the leader of the loners, um, she welcomes him and lets out the rules. You know, this is the, the bloody kiss. Um, these two people were caught kissing, so we slashed their mouths with razor blades and made them kiss. She sets out clearly what's at the stake in this world. She so and in a way, stakes are kind of pressures, aren't they? Right? They force you to do something. If there's no stakes, you wouldn't do it. I mean, that's kind of like a surprisingly late revelation for this. You know, gold mm-hmm. stakes urgency. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're you know, mm-hmm. stakes are kind of related to obstacles and pressures create urgencies. I mean, they're both forms. What what are the goals and the antagonist? Stakes are a form of antagonist, urgency is a form of antagonist. Blah. Um, very clearly. So, what's the worst pressure that can happen to David in this environment? He falls in love and then he has to keep it secret. I mean, it seems so obvious, but it's beautifully orchestrated. He ends up falling in love with a woman that goes with them on the mini- this raid to- um, Oh, no. It's, it's, it's not the raid into the city. I'm thinking of the raid- I think they do that first. I don't know. At some point, they they, they raid they the go hotel. Into the ci- they go into the city and, and what you've got know, to I'm is really important. About- no, okay. I want to give you a mini. Yeah. This is a great yeah, yeah. little scene where the character is not in. David's not in it at all. The loners go into the hotel to sabotage it. Right? David decides he wants to go to see the nosebleed woman and man, um, and their friends, and then basically he reveals that John has been faking to her. So he, David at that point is the antagonist. He is acting out the loners, but he's the antagonist to them. He is basically, John has been lying. He reveals the truth and tries to see what's happening. While the other loners, the leader, this is this is the genius part, hold the hotel manager and her husband at gunpoint. Do you love her? With all my heart. How much do you love her? On a scale of 1 to 15. 14. 14 is a very impressive score. He loves her very much indeed. Who do you think we should kill? Who will be able to live on their own better? You. If this woman dies, do you think you'll manage on your own or will you get involved with someone else? No. No, I can live alone. She can't. I'm on my own for hours when she's running the hotel. I like sitting in the room. Relaxes me. Calms me. I like it a lot. I can definitely live on my own. Be quiet. Take it. Shoot her. And basically, David's not part of that scene at all. But they're the antagonists to these two minor characters to see whether the husband is willing to kill the wife rather than sacrifice himself. And he does. He pulls the trigger and it turns out it's blank because that's the best form of pressure, right? Her, the wife, realising that the husband doesn't love her that much he is not prepared to die for her and then they leave and that scene is completely self-contained but it is so good because and it works because of the antagonistic forces but now you can jump to the uh secret relationship no no i'm not jumping to the secret relationship i want to talk about that sequence because what it does is it gives the audience the feeling that once he's joined the loners the loners have a goal of overthrowing the rules of the world. But they don't. Mm. That is what that's that is what that entire sequence is about. It is the loners attacking the hotel and proving that their systems are better. bullshit. But they're actually Sorry, yeah, the, the hotels is bullshit, not that the, the yes. loners one is, right? And once they've done that, it's leaving you in a kind of good place positively overall because it's like the the antagonistic forces are defeatable and internally David and Rachel Weiss's character short-sighted woman have met and are falling in love and it's then that the rules of the loners rise up against David and the short-sighted woman yes 
that's me throwing to you to to yeah. to to talk about the short sighted woman getting blinded. Well, okay, yeah. So the initially it's will they get caught? That's kind of the pressure on those and all the the having a secret relationship. We've developed a code so that we can communicate with each other, even in front of the others, without them knowing what we are saying. When we turn our heads to the left, it means, I love you more than anything in the world. And when we turn our heads to the right, it means, watch out, we're in danger. We had to be very careful in the beginning not to mix up, I love you more than anything in the world with, watch out, we're in danger. And the them going into the city gives them the opportunity to show their affection to each other, but do too much and they'll catch the attention of the leader. And that is exactly what happens, right? The freedom, they are caught. And what happens is the the short-sighted woman is taken by the leader. Um, and actually the maid, who turns out was a double agent, <laughs> has found this diary about how they're planning on running away together. And... The leader leads her to a optometry or a surgeon saying that she'll get her eyes fit. Um, so, as an antagonist, she literally changes Rachel. She physically changes Rachel. So, Rachel is blind. And then it sets up the final dramatic question of, will David accept her as she now is? And previously, this is previously their whole body language. They had developed a secret communication scheme of body language of pointing to their ears or their nose or whatever. And she's blind. They can no longer communicate mm. and so this is the final test for his ability to fall in love will he want to be her companion if they don't have matching attributes in a world where it's like we both have no bleeds let's get married yay we both have limps let's get married yay we're both heartless and want to kill my mm. kill dogs let's mm. get married yay mm. you know and the answer is we think yep. yes right yeah can can i can i just go back quickly to that that decision by the loner's leader mm. to take short-sighted woman to have LASIK surgery. Yes, her intention is to blind the woman, but even if it was to actually fix her eyes and not destroy the relationship that David and short-sighted woman have, the thing is that David and short-sighted woman have been falling in love in breach of the rules of the loners, and they've been falling in love along the parameters laid out by this- mm by the the rules of the hotel in that, oh, you find something in common, that means you can fall in love. Like nosebleed woman and um, limping man punching himself in the face. Whereas these two have a genuine love connection, but it, it is formed on the basis of them both being short-sighted. So, even if a short-sighted woman's eyes were going to actually be fixed, she wouldn't want that because under the rules of this world, that might mean that she loses the love relationship she has with David. What's worse is that, you know, she gets blinded, so she is left alone in the world and unable to communicate to anyone. Exactly. Right. So, it puts, it puts the most pressure on the relationship at the end of the film. Them correcting her eyes does not put enough pressure on the character or on him to make those final, the final choice. Like, okay, I'll get LASIK surgery. That's not what they want. That's not the goal of the antagonist at this point. Right? And ultimately, David makes the decision to kill the leader and to lead <laughs> Rachel away into the city. And they can be a companion. Right? But the city will only accept them as companions if they are both blind. I don't think the- I don't think the city comments on that. I think it's them feeling- Oh, no, it, it does. Yeah, it doesn't. But it, it feels very part of the rules of the world that these two will only be allowed to live together in the city. Convince anyone. If he stabs his knives out, stabs his eyes out yeah. with the stake. I would say that whether they can convince anyone that they're genuinely in love is if he- And, and the film ends with the question of, will he do it? That doesn't actually answer it. Yeah. And ends with her waiting and waiting. And we're like, ooh, maybe he's realized he's not prepared to go that far. Has the pressures on the on him meant that he's made the decision where he's not prepared to sacrifice his sight for someone else? But, you know, it sounds- I mean, it is an absurd film, but it hopefully we've- demonstrated how it credibly builds the antagonistic forces that that is the binary decision that he comes to at the end of the film. The different 
s- rules of the different worlds in which he inhabits have put pressure on him to the point where this is a very, very credible decision. We don't know which way he's going to go. Yeah. But that it fits. And, it, and it's worth noting that he was part of the system at the beginning. We don't know whether he was a believer or not. He just accepted it as it being the way things are, which I guess is something he could say about Mudbound. Henry just was like, these are the way, these, this is the order of things. Yeah. Right. Whereas I think in Minority Report and even Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, it wasn't a, this is the way of things. I think Cobra and whatever the- the Gary, Gary Oldman. Oldman's character, like the governor <laughs> or whatever. I think they saw it as the way of things. This is the way of things. I don't think Malcolm or Caesar accepted that. And I think what is interesting about David's journey is I think it's credible that he doesn't do it, that he kind of rejects both systems as well. I think that's the strength of the film. You don't know. It's genuinely ambiguous. But it works as ambiguity and not confusion because either he does it or he doesn't. Yeah. And is it romantic for him to do it or not? Is him not being blind and still loving her more romantic than him choosing to blind herself? I think that's the great questions. And they're about worldview as well. A very a worldview of a very specific, fictional, absurd place. But, <laughs> ref- but we use it to reflect on our own reality, you know? Yeah. Oh. So- We've got here a quick note about other uh, genres of films where the world is the primary antagonistic force. And it's interestingly high school films. That's the main one that kind of came to mind. This is not your typical high school. See, here at John Q's, there are no cliques, no exclusive social groups. You're accepted for who you are, not for who you hang out with. (laughs) Okay, we're going to divide the tour into several smaller groups so you can get to know some of your peers a little bit better. Let's get all you big jockey guys over here to my right in one group and then get you slutty girls over here by me. Hey, how you doing? Welcome. And uh, you losers, you guys should hang out in the back. Hey, hey, that clearly includes you. Come on, get back there. Take a good look at the kids standing beside you. Hey, they're going to be your only friends for the next four years. Okay, let's move it. And this can be presented in various different ways. Like, you know, Brick is the most heightened version of that, where it's a noir gangster setting within a high school. But the fact that that works shows that high school can be a world. Mean Girls. Yeah, Mean Girls, 10 Things I Hate About You, Easy A, Super Bad. The point is that those films work because high school has defined rules and often the protagonist's job is not actually to- it. The protagonist starts out, how do I fit into these rules? And they often come to the point where I win by changing the world, challenging the world and changing how the rules work. Be it that, you know, girls with glasses can be pretty or nerds can- be, be cool, accepted or get girls or whatever those stupid yeah are. Mm. yeah but it's i'm not limiting it to high school films i'm just saying we've we've chosen we've looked in depth at four different genres very very different genres and there are whole there are story arcs where if the character is trying to change the world around them. I mean, I maybe think- sports movies. I mean, I came to that from like Friday Night Lights, which is a high school sports movie. But, you know, sports being a system, possibly. Um, well, Moneyball is definitely that. Yeah. Well, I mean, gangster movies, probably. You know, the sense of circularity and inevitability. I definitely think those gangster stories where it's about someone trying to escape the gangster world and getting drawn back in. Yeah, I mean, Donny, maybe Donny Brasco. Um, I mean, you know, what's and, and whether or not things are inevitable. I think in Mudbound, we talked about it, but it's an interesting idea when you're constructing your story as a writer. You know, in Mudbound, I think, unfortunately, what happens to Ronzel is kind of at a certain point is inevitable. Unless he succumbs. Unless he submits to the system. He submits if he if he didn't submit to the system, then the system's going to punish him. And and I think that's true of what's interesting about Lobster is the question is does David submit to the system? Does he escape it or does he overthrow it? And I think I don't think he ever questioned thinks that he can overthrow it. In the film, it's implied that maybe this 
system of couples is around the world. Other than the sequence where they break into the hotel. Yeah. It's on a very small scale, but that is exactly what they're doing. Is trying their objective is to overthrow the system. Yeah. Oh, they're, yeah. They're definitely um, putting throwing sticks of uh, rocks into the water. I mean, even something as nihilistic as I mean, this that properly like the road. There's very much. It's like a survival film plus a system film. And the question is, do they succumb to the nihilism of that world? Do they maintain their morality or not? You know, and their hope. And I think the film ends with hope. The system is kind of in its own way overthrown at the end of the road. So you got two choices here. You can stay here with your papa or you can go with me. If you stay here, you need to keep off the road. I don't know you're one of the good guys. You don't. You just have to take a shot. I think I'm, I'm just going to, while we're talking about this, I'm going to jump to my key learning from systems is I think from a craft perspective. Oh, I thought that's what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think just to tell the audience that that's what we're doing. From a craft perspective, I've learned two things to ask of my story. Mm. Is it a character objective to change the rules of the world or not? Which is not to say you can't have system antagonists where that isn't a character objective, but I think it changes the shape of the story that you're telling. Mm. And, you know, we looked at Minority Report where all sequences except for the fourth and final act of the film are not about the John Anderton trying to overthrow the system. So, just parking that for clarity. But what we came to in- Nature and Supernatural in part three about determining how defeatable is your antagonist is becoming really important to me or really clear as a valuable insight because your your protagonist will act differently in the face of hope mm. and the and what tactics are available to them to achieve an objective. Yes, if there's the, the possibility of overcoming the system that literally changes what goals you can have and literally um, that allows you to change, will change the kind of goals you have and the tactics you use to achieve that if you believe that it's doable, yeah. that you can, and, and it needs to be for the audience to do it. If there was a hypothetical version of the lobster where he somehow, I don't know, blew up a computer and the world changed, would be like, what? Whereas if we get the sense that it was limited to a country- and then all he had to do was escape across the border. That's not him overthrowing the system, but it's him escaping in a very permanent yeah. way. And it's why I was so impressed on this analysis at the decisions, the craft and writing decisions in Minority Report to limit precogs to just a city. It really defined the scale of antagonism and gave it limits. It really did. If John Anderton wasn't heavily invested in protecting pre-crime, he could have just escaped Washington, D.C. Yeah. Who's to say that pre-crime had jurisdiction outside of the state? Absolutely. Well, his, his, <laughs> his, he'd had his eyes changed. He could just escape. But his objective was to prove his own innocence because he believed in pre-crime. Yeah. Fantastic observation. Whereas- yeah, I mean, Dawn and the Planet of the Apes, they didn't really have the option to escape. I mean, they do kind of in War of the Worlds, but- War No, but they had they had options very early on. Do they interact or not? Like the yes. inciting incident is the meeting of those two worlds and then mm. making decisions, do we collaborate or not? Yeah. And it's their collaboration that actually leads to the escalating antagonistic pressures within both social structures and between them. Mm. Do you have some key learnings, Stu? Do I have some key learnings? I think there's some very interesting stuff, whether it's different from what we started with. I, I guess the kind of just the way we've talked about it, thinking about it from the point of view at the end, where do you want to take your character to at the end? This is very craft related. Yeah. And thinking about how you sequence your events in order for that to happen is very 
useful. And I, as I said, we're seeing films that actually work over the length of their runtime. They're all good examples, but I'm sure we've all seen films in which the characters should have turned away, turned around and just left, or that they should have literally been crushed under the might of the antagonistic forces that you can escalate. I think something that came out of The Lobster was the power of letting characters have secrets and lies and and pretend, for the lack of the word, like putting- Putting a, having a character lie and then pressurizing them for that lie. I mean, that's a whole sequence about it. And I'm sure if we looked at it, Mudbound has that, has some of the sequences like that. Where the, I mean, obviously, Jamie does lie about Ronzel and the, that lie is challenged and challenged and challenged until ultimately the truth of their friendship is brought to light. Ronzel doesn't tell his family about his son, uh, Laura- and Jamie hide their their um, affair from Henry. I think you're hitting on something there. And all of our different theses is kind of interconnect. But you articulating it in that the antagonistic forces have to pressure the protagonist to lead to the end and the end of the film working is kind of alluding to what I was getting to right back in part one in saying the antagonistic forces shape the journey and shape the character. In the eyes of the audience, like in the eyes of the writer, the character appears on page one preformed, mm. but not in the eyes of the audience. Yeah. And it's funny how we ended up coming coming to binary choices a number of times, given that we want to do it as its own specific topic. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and maybe because we don't articulate why those choices are important, we're using them as, I mean, are we implying that's a fait accompli? I mean, hopefully we've done a good job about how specifically those forces lead to it. Um, that final choice, I hope so. But I realize that people could be like, and stuff happens and they make this choice. <laughs> um, yeah. And hopefully it's like stuff happens, then more stuff happens and it's worse and more stuff happens, it's worse. Because I guess they're in ways, <sighs> I guess it's the worst possible and this is a hard thing to end on. And I wish I come with it earlier. It's like there's f- versions of that binary choice littered throughout the films, but it's the biggest, most grandest expression of that at the very end. So if you're saying that Ron Zell's final choice is do he does he submit to the system or does he stand proudly? That there's versions of that. Him choosing to walk through the back door is him choosing to submit to the system. And that comes along and there's probably versions where he chooses not to, but ultimately they they keep on escalating to the worst possible version of that. The lobster, him, David deciding whether or not he stabs himself in the eye is a version of the choice of do I lie to about the heart to the heartless woman that I'm heartless? It's that same choice. And we've seen him make a similar choice where he wasn't prepared to live with a woman who killed her brother, his brother. He wasn't prepared to live with a woman who killed his brother in a dog form. For the sake of the relationship. The question is whether he will prepare to stab himself in the eye. So, no, actually, I think we kind of indirectly have, and I'm trying to sum it up. Those choices they make at the end of the film are in various forms, asks, they're presented with forms of those choices, either where they make different choices. No, 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 no. Okay, yes. <laughs> right? Which is all <laughs> is lost. All is lost, yeah. Or they make the right choices, but they the moral pressure on them it's easy to stand up when you're to it's easy to protect ronzel and pretend that you're a good man when your life is not on the line is the case on the jamie and as soon as his life's on the line and and ronzel's life on the line jamie makes a different choice so yes i think that's how pressure works in these stories (sighs) Well, we hope you've enjoyed the first four parts of our exploration on antagonists. Our next one is to actually look at, uh, I'm going to throw out just an inaccurate term, non-narrative films to see how this bears up and also answer your questions that these four parts may have raised. So, please do send in any questions, preferably in audio form, but you can uh, write them in look to our website for details as to how to ask us questions. And thanks to our patrons who have inspired us to turn what was proposed to be a one episode into five. So they are to blame. And particularly our Patreon Jack, who asked us the inciting incident question, but also 
Paul, Sandra, Rob, Chris, Joachim, and Krob. Thanks, guys. You're all oh, right. And thanks to, I'm going to totally butcher this pronunciation, but Murbib Musings, who is our latest patron, who in fact pledged and supported us while we were recording this very episode. So, so thanks, extra special thanks to Murbib Musings. <laughs> if you feel so compelled to argue with Chaz and myself about anything on this episode or anything in general, you can find many ways to contact us at draft-zero.com. And there you will also find the show notes for this episode, as well as links to share the word and, and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you're feeling even more supportive, you can also find links to our Patreon page. Having lunch with the plastics was like leaving the actual world and entering girl world. And girl world had a lot of rules. You can't wear a tank top two days in a row, and you can only wear your hair in a ponytail once a week. So I guess you pick today. Oh, and we only wear jeans or track pants on Fridays. Now, if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Well, I mean, not just you, like any of us. Okay, like if I was wearing jeans today, I would be sitting over there with the art freaks. <laughs> oh, and we always vote before we ask someone to eat lunch with us because you have to be considerate of the rest of the group. Well, I mean, you wouldn't buy a skirt without asking your friends first if it looks good on you. I wouldn't. Right. Oh, and it's the same with guys. Like, you may think you like someone, but you could be wrong. 120 calories and 48 calories from fat. What percent is that? I 48 into 120? I'm only eating foods with less than 30% calories from fat. It's 40%. Well, 48 over 120 equals X over 100. And then you cross multiply and get the value of X. Whatever. I'm getting cheese fries.